Okay, welcome back to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is the 17th show, and this is our weekly show where hopefully we get to answer all your tech-related mountain bike questions. You can get your questions into us in the comments below this very video. We'll be patrolling that afterwards. And also you can send them in at the email address that's at the bottom of the screen there. Don't forget to use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech if you're sending in emails or you're contacting us via Facebook. Just makes it easy for us to spot what you're trying to get. First up is from Carl. Hi guys, I'm in the market for a new 29er trail bike. I was at a bike store and the guy in there recommended a giant Anthem 29er for trail riding. It's only got 100 mil of travel, but it's got Fox suspension on the front and rear. It's the only bike in my price range with full Fox suspension. Would you say this would be a good bike for trail riding or should I look at a different bike? If so, what would you recommend? Well, firstly, technically, the Anthem is an XC bike. So that's by Giant, it's 100 mil travel, and it was designed originally for the World Cup, basically. So all those boys and girls are riding the Giant Anthem. So it's a very trail-friendly bike, and those 29-inch wheels do make it feel like it rides with slightly more travel than it has, and it's certainly gonna be robust enough for day-to-day -day trail use, but, their trail focused bike from Giant is actually called the Trance. And it's got quite a lot more travel and it's gonna ride a lot differently. I mean, if you're not really into the sort of riding that involves loads of jumping and sort of aggressive terrain, I'd be more than happy riding the Anthem. But don't forget, whatever bike you're riding, you can go out and ride trails on them, you can ride cross country on them. You don't be too sort of confined by what the bike tells you to do. It's only at the upper end of the scale where you shouldn't really go downhill racing on a cross country bike, you know, because you are clearly going to damage that bike. So in your, a long way around to your answer, yeah, the Anthem is absolutely fine. Enjoy it. Next up is a brake related question from Doug Watts. Well, it's not really a question. It's a Hope, Hope V4 versus Shimano Saint brakes. Um, to be honest, they're both excellent brakes. I like them both. Um, I haven't ridden Hope brakes for quite some time. I quite like to try it again to sort of remind myself of them. I always used to run Hope brakes back in my magazine days. Always loved them, especially like the color options and the customizations you can do with them. I like the fact they've got braided hoses. They're really tough, especially good if you're into crashing because they're quite robust with that sort of thing. But then the Shimano's, they're incredibly powerful. Perhaps almost too powerful for my liking. I prefer something not quite as grabby as the Saint. I've found, to be honest, the SLX has been absolutely fine, or the XT, something like that. But they've got that characteristic wooden sort of Shimano feel with a really small lever blade that's really comfortable. They're both excellent. Of course, the Hopes use dot fluid and the Shimano's use mineral fluid, but they're both very easy and quite similar to bleed, actually. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Depends what sort of build you're doing. The Shimano's are no nonsense, they work, never gonna let you down, any of that stuff. But I hope are certainly a lot tricker. Next up is from Heath Norton. Cool name. Um, I bought a 24 inch Rocky Mountain bike for my daughter. It's a nice frame with some decent components, but the front fork is a cheap Suntour unit. She only weighs about 55 pounds, so the fork doesn't really activate for her. Yeah, that is a bit of a problem with some of the kids' bikes I felt as well, actually. Um, I've been looking at upgrading her fork, but I've not found any good options. Is it possible to rework her fork to make it more responsive at the lower end, or should I just upgrade it? Um, are there any good fork options for 24 inch bikes? I've heard old RockShox SID forks can work, but the bike has V brakes and integrated levers and shifters, so it would be expensive to upgrade to disc brakes. Uh, plus, I've not been able to find any 26 to 24 V brake adapters. Okay, so first up with the tuning, I'm not entirely familiar with the 24 inch Suntour forks, but most suspension tuners, you'd be amazed at the magic that they can work on those to make them feel good. Um, I'd have to ask a few questions to some of the guys I know to, to work that one out. So let's just move on to the next bit. Yeah, I think you're right about those RockShox SID forks. I've heard that as well. This is quite an older cross country fork. It's quite low, the axle to crown height. So it's probably gonna be fairly similar to that 24 inch fork. Of course, most kids mountain bikes these days do come with 26 inch forks with a 24 in there. So you don't have to worry about that sort of thing in the future. Uh, I definitely would recommend trying that out. I think that'd be a good option, but you would have to get disc brakes with that. And I wouldn't worry about spending too much money on that because you wouldn't need to do anything with the integrated shift and brake lever because you could just get a cable operated brake caliper and a rotor. Um, you may need a front wheel though. Of course, that is an expense. Um, 
a Shimano do the Dior caliper, and they're about 40 quid. They're not a lot of money, and the disc rotor you get them for about 10 quid, so 50 quid for a break. I appreciate the fact that it's a kid's bike, you probably don't want to spend too much money on it, but that is one way around that issue. The other thing just to factor in is upgrading the fork full stop to another one. Now, of course, the only thing you really need to take into consideration is that axle to crown height. So literally from the axle to the crown where the crown race of the, of the headset sits on there. Now, if you're replacing it with a 26 inch wheel fork, you really wanna make sure you don't wanna go above, say, anything above 20 mil longer really is gonna sort of mess up that handling quite a lot. You could probably get away with up to 20 mil on a kid's bike and it won't be too adverse. And of course, you'll get a fork that will hopefully be a lot more responsive and work better for her. Next up's from Joel Riley. Hi guys, love the show. I'm riding a 2009 Santa Cruz XC Blur. Yes, nice bike, mate. I uh, ride it hard because I'm more of a rider who takes the fun line instead of the fast one. Should I get a new trail 150mm bike or something bigger um, or smaller? My Santa Cruz is about 11.2 kilos and my dad says I'll miss it if I get something with bigger travel that's heavier. Um, if I were to get a trail bike, it would be around $2,000. I live in South Africa, by the way, by the beach, and I'm 15. Um, well, wicked, love your country for starters. I really enjoyed our recent trip out to South Africa. Um, and I do think your dad's quite right, actually. So most of the mountain bikers we met when we were in South Africa were all sort of cross-country trail riders. So they're all running either hardtails or suspension bikes like your Santa Cruz Blur with around 100 millimeters of travel. Now, I don't think that you, A, probably need any more travel than that if you've been riding it for so long, but you could, if you wanted to make the bike a little bit more fun, make it feel a little bit more aggressive without having to spend the earth on the thing. So you could upgrade the fork or maybe get your fork travel extended. Now, depending on what fork you have on there, that might just be a case of getting the air tube that's on the inside of the fork, getting a slightly longer one, which would require doing a service on the fork, but it's a cool way of just getting a bit more travel out of what you had. So on a 100 mil bike, you could get away with a 120 mil fork. By the time it sags, you'd probably be only a little bit longer than the standard fork length on there, but it gives you that extra 20 mil of travel to play with, which can make quite a big difference. If you do that, of course, you might end up having to put your stem down slightly, maybe one 10 mil spacer just to compensate for that, and you might need to tip the nose of your saddle down. If you go for any more travel, it really will mess up the handling of that bike, and that's a really nice bike. Just bear that in mind. Now, I've also just written a note to myself here about the Yeti SB100, which we talked about on the show a week or two back. Now, that's a 100mm travel XC frame, but it's specced with a 120mm fork. Now, we've also seen the brand new Santa Cruz Blur, 100mm travel, also being specced with a 120mm fork. And I think actually that's going to be a sort of quite a magical sort of style of bike for a lot of riders over the coming years. Now, we often see people on trail bikes that have 150 mil, even 170 mil travel. And I think people are probably a little bit overbiked for what they need. Don't get me wrong, this is a fun game and it's important to be having fun. So by all means, ride whatever you wanna ride. But I do think that a longer travel bike can isolate you from the trail a bit. And the thing about riding a short travel bike like that 100 mil travel blur you've got is you've got more than enough travel to get you out of trouble. Also, you've got enough travel to give you enough traction on those trails to really hammer along, but you're still gonna be able to feel the trail underneath the wheels. And for me, that's one of the things I love. It's about fun at the end of the day. If you wanna go really fast and that's how you need to do it, then that's great, good for you. If you wanna have fun in a different way, which it sounds like you do, carry on doing what you're doing. Maybe just look at a slightly longer fork though, and it'll save you money on buying a bike. However, if you do want to buy a new bike and you are looking for something, I'd say probably 120, 130 mil is something you should buy. Um, just for example, just throwing this one up on the screen now, so Canyon Neuron. It's available in both 27 and a half inch wheel and 29 inch wheels, and they've got several different price options on there, and there's one right in your price point. So maybe that could be the right sort of bike for you. Hope you make the right choice. Hi Doddy, I have a setup question. Currently I'm running a 35mm Onza stem on my Commercel V4 All Mountain Meta. When I'm climbing trails, I find the front wheel lifts and is trying to do a wheelie. Would a slightly longer reach stem solve this problem? Thanks, Tim. 
uh, yeah, it completely would. So there's a few reasons that this could be happening. Of course, the short stem is one, but let's start with the saddle. If your saddle is too far back, then you're going to be too far over the rear balance point, which when you're climbing is the rear axle of that bike. You want to be your body weight in front of that, or at least try and keep it that way. So of course, by having a shorter stem, if your bike is not long enough, then you're going to be too far biased towards the rear of the bike, in which case a longer stem would definitely correct that. However, that will change the handling of your bike. And by putting a longer stem on there, you are gonna feel that it's gonna be harder to pick the front wheel up for stuff like manuals or the bunny hop. So you do need to sort of do this gently and play around. So see if your friends have any slightly longer stems, maybe a 50, that's not gonna to interfere too much with it. And also consider the height you have your stem at. The higher the stem, the shorter your bike effectively is because of the angle of that head tube. So the lower the stem, the slight, slightly more reach you're gonna get out of that bike. It's only sort of an effective thing, it's not an actual official measurement with the way reach is measured, but you can eke out a little bit more length on the, the same length stem. Of course, changing your stem is gonna cost you a bit of money to do that, so try a few different setup things first. Now, of course, if you do find that you need to add a stem that's over 50 mil length, then it might be the case of the bike being a bit too short for you, which is quite often the case with people. They buy a bike because they want it to sort of be fun and flickable and on those trails, but quite often to get that, you have to have a bike that's on the smaller side, which may be fun on those jumpy fun trails, but it's never gonna climb or pedal as well as a bike that truly fits you. So hopefully you can figure this out with a slightly longer stem, maybe tweaking your saddle so it's slightly further forward, and perhaps even just rolling your bars forward and lowering your stem, it might get your bike dialed in. But hopefully that's the case then, just a slightly longer stem might cure your climbing issue. Tubeless related now, this one's from Hayley Clark. Hi Doddy, I have a 2015 Cube Stereo and I wanna go tubeless, however, my wheels take Schrader valves, the big ones, that's the car valve basically, if anyone wonders what that is. Would the regular tubeless Presta valves like the one in your tubeless video work? Um, and if so, which ones or am I stuck with tubes? Thanks for the help, you've helped me work on my bike at home on several occasions. Well, great. So I'm gonna help you again now because you don't need to worry about this. There's a few options out there. So on the screen now, firstly, Stans No Tubes. So the company Stans that did the first proper conversion kit for tubeless. They met valves in both Presta, which I showed in that video, and also in Schrader, which is the ones that you need. Now they do two versions, a 10 mil and a 12 mil. It does depend on the drilling for your rim, so check that out. Also, they do an adapter. And the adapter plugs that hole in the rim and then you can run a regular Presta one in there. So that's one way around it. And also there's another company called Joe's No Flats, very similar name to Stan's No Tubes. Um, but Joe's No Flats make Schrader tubeless valves as well. So you should be able to get some of those and get your bike set up tubeless, hopefully no problem. Good luck. Next up from Ben Kusher. First off, great channel, great team. You're doing a great job. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you to everyone for, for following us, watching the videos and actually commenting on them. It's great to have that feedback from you. So your question is, I've uh, been watching your SRAM bleeding clip. I got myself an Avid kit for my SRAM Guide RS brakes. Uh, it's on a Canyon Spectral 2017 model. But I noticed that the fitting of the syringe is threaded and different from the syringe fitting that you're using in your clip. Does it also work with a threaded syringe for the SRAM models after 2015? I'd like to avoid opening packaging in terms of possible exchange. I'll send you a pic for the bike vault soon. Yes, please do. Okay, so this is the fitting that you have from your description and this is the fitting that I used in the video. So they're both for SRAM brakes. This is for the older style and this is the one that's got the bleeding edge port on there. Now the way you can identify which one you need to use is if you look on the screen right now. Now the one on the left hand side of the screen is the brake that you need the threaded style adapter like you already have. And the one on the right is the one for the bleeding edge. That should help you identify which one of these that you do need. Now not all SRAM brakes have that port. Now I've had some newer bikes in my collection that still have the older style port. And some of the older ones have the newer style ports. So there are certain serial numbers of brake that have changed over the years, that, but all brakes from now moving forwards will have that bleeding edge port. Now you can also just buy the bleeding edge adapter 
and use that on your existing syringe kit. So you can have that and that way you've got everything covered for all occasions. So that is worth considering, especially if you've gone to the hassle of having a bleeding kit in the first place, it's kind of good to have more stuff than less because you can help your, help your mates bleed their brakes, all that sort of stuff. So there's a link on the screen as well to where you can get a bleeding edge tool. And obviously those two photos will hopefully help you identify which one that you need. Next up is a good question. I really like this one. This is from Alexander Ashman. I just noticed a tear in the sidewall of my tire and I wonder if it's a problem. I have no idea how it happened. Should I do something about it or is it fine? Let's have a look at this picture. So the tire is a specialist ground control. Yeah, that's a pretty big tire slash in there. It doesn't look like it's gone all the way through, but on the actual sidewall, I can start to see some of the threading in there. Ideally, you should replace it. However, I made a video on repairing a tire sidewall slash just like this one. So if you look on the screen at the moment, you can see how I'm doing the repair. And I'll just run you through it. So what you need to do is take the tire off your bike completely, get yourself a decent needle and thread, so I use linen thread because it's really quite tough stuff. It's quite a thick thread and you need a leather needle to get through that tire sidewall. And you can simply stitch that up. Once you've stitched it, you're gonna need some sort of vulcanizing rubber glue on the outside of the tire. The one I used in the video is called Shugu. It's basically designed for skateboarding shoes to put on your leading edge foot. So when you're doing ollies and stuff, you're not gonna really wear out your trainers. As a result, this stuff is really flexible. So it works perfectly on the outside of a tire. Then on the inside of the tire, you're gonna to need to repair that as well, just to make sure there's no chance of that split going through. Now I use an all-terrain vehicle tire patch. There's various different ones on the market. You can get them on Amazon and any sort of online place. Repair that with your typical vulcanizing solution and then you're good to go. Make sure that you monitor it though and make sure you don't start running really high pressures in it because the thread won't hold. But it does mean you're gonna be able to get more use out of that tire before you have to throw it away for recycling. So there we go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech Weekly Clinic in the bag. If you've got any comments about any of the questions on this week's show, just add them in those comments below. The email address is on the screen. If you send in any questions for us, please don't forget to use that hashtag, Ask GMBN Tech. We're getting so many emails from you guys, we wanna make sure that we can find them easily and answer them all. For a couple more great videos, click down here for all the weird and wonderful stuff we saw out of Sea Otter. And for the second Sea Otter tech video, click down here. As always, click on that globe to subscribe. We've got brand new content for you every single week and tell your friends about us as well. And as always, if you like the video or you found it helpful, give us a thumbs up.